not about to get better. It's going to get better. That's when you know God is moving on it. Will you pray with me? I'm excited to get into the word today. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life and the gift of your word. Now our desire is to align our life with your word that you may look upon us and say, well done. Thank you that we don't have to struggle to find our way, but your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We believe your word to be true. And we believe you to be a God who's still in control. So Lord, I ask now that you anoint mind and mouth, head and heart, ear and hearing, that as we receive, we may also do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today we come to the conclusion of our series on money matters. In this month of January, as we seek to start the year off right, we've been looking at what the Word of God teaches and informs us about how we handle our money. And today we come to the final installment of this series. And I want to invite those who've not been with us or may have missed a Sunday to please make sure you catch it online or watch the sermons. The teachings build upon one another so that what we share today is the culmination of where we began the first weekend in January. Today, as we do come to the conclusion, I'm going to invite you to the Gospel of Matthew. If you would turn to the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, as I've shared with you this weekend, if you've got a good Bible, that should be read. It should all be read. Both pages, both pages should be read. Um, Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, and we ask those who are physically able, if you would stand with us as we reverence the reading of God's Word from Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do people gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. For this last sermon series, help me declare the title of the sermon. Somebody say, show me the money. Show me the money. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Show me the money. All month long, I've been sharing with you what I pray you've embraced and received by now and that you know to be true from your own life, and that is that money matters. Money matters to you. It helps determine the quality of life you have and to provide your needs, to leave an inheritance for our children and our children's children. Money speaks volumes about who you are as a person. Not necessarily what you earn, but how you handle what you have. You don't need to listen to what somebody tells you they love. Just look at where they spend their money. I shared with you, you already know that when you're under investigation, as some of you have been, <laughs> uh, the police follow the money trail because the money talks about who you really are. Not only does money matter to you, but hopefully this month you've learned money matters to God. How you handle your money is critical to the Lord, which is why money is the most raised and referenced issue in all the Bible. Because money can quickly become God's number one competitor for lordship in your life. The older you grow, the longer you live, you're going to find that there are moments when you've got to make a deliberate decision. Do you trust in earning money or do you trust your faith in God? God and money can compete with one another, which is why God has commandment on us of how we handle our money that we may prove money has never become our God. Beloved, you already know that money has a way of driving a wedge in any relationship. As a matter of fact, I'd be willing to bet that if you've earned your own salary and you work now, there are probably some folk you have cut loose 
because y'all can't agree on how to handle money. There's some friends I don't like going to dinner with. Because they always come up short. You know that, that experience of sending the bill around? And when it comes back, it's a little bit short because somebody was trying to nickel and dime. I didn't have a Coke and the tax ain't mine. I'm not doing a tip. I can't stand some cheap folk. Money has a way of driving a wedge. Marriages have ended over money. And the question I want to ask is, is there a wedge in your relationship with God because of money? So in this series, we've tried to address some issues. Why does God call us to give? That was message one. Message number two, how does God call us to give? And we looked at the basics of tithing. Message number three, how tithing may be an Old Testament law, but those who are in covenant through Jesus are called to live in grace, and grace supersedes law, and therefore we not only seek to tithe, we seek to be graceful givers. Graceful givers are those who prayerfully prepare what they're going to bring. They don't just find an offering on Sunday morning. They don't just live by the law of tithing. They pray and ask the Holy Spirit to place on their heart what God would desire them to give. Graceful givers cheerfully contribute because with God, it's not the amount, it's the attitude. And God desires us to be cheerful, hilarious givers. Hilarious, meaning that when it's offering time, you, you ought to be throwing your offering at the usher when they walk by because you're excited to give back unto God because when you give, don't do that, by the way, but when you give to God, you're not paying a bill, you're gaining the favor of God. And what could be more valuable in your life than knowing that God looks on you and says, well done? And the good news is that cheerful givers, givers who give prayerfully, also receive reciprocally, that whenever you sow, you're always going to reap. God will never break the promise of giving back what you've given unto him. The Lord knows how to return to sowers. So I've shared with you this weekend that if you are struggling financially, I promise you it's not because you gave to God. I'll say that again. If you are struggling financially, it's not because you gave to God. If you are broke, it's not because you tithe. God always returns what's been given. I'm so grateful to God for the testimony that I've heard from so many members who started in January of, of trying God and stepping out on God and giving to God, and before the month was over, have already received a return on what they've given. A few weekends ago in the tithing sermon, I called a young lady up who was unemployed. And you all didn't know that at that moment, she was struggling even to buy groceries. And so in an example of exchange, I gave her $225. Really, it was $250, but she gave the tithe back. She texted me this week to let me know that she's already received a job that she starts on next Monday. Amen. That, let me tell you how good God is. Someone was in a room and mentioned her name. They created the job for her. She was the only one allowed to apply for it, and the job was significantly more than the job that she lost, and now she's able to take care of all of her bills, and God is a rewarder of those who tithe. When you give to God, God always gives back. He is a provider. So my hope at the end of this series, I'm not trying to get you to give more. I simply want you to begin to pray. Ask God to reveal to your heart what your giving should be, and then obey whatever the Holy Spirit says. I have another agenda item, though. Now, I've been clear about this. I want to destroy the negative stereotype that church has when it comes to money. Church gets a bad rap when it comes to money, and you know that there are people who stand outside the church and laugh about how we raise offerings, gimmicks and tricks and tactics, and they criticize and judge and 
mock our financial habits and they tell you things like all that money's going to the pastor and they're not doing anything in the community. They ain't helping their own people. And they have this negative stereotype. And my prayer is that when our time as pastor and people are done here at Alfred Street, that we will have modeled and exemplified something dramatically different to the world. I don't like black church being comedic material. I want the world to look at this church and know that we were a light that proved something different. I want people to say Alpha Street is different. Y'all start on time. <laughs> Amen. Church ain't three hours long. The message shapes my heart and challenges my mind. That we think, then we shout, or we shout, and then we think, but we're going to do both of them every Sunday. Um, and that when you came here, you felt financially protected. That no one was going to beg you. No one was going to call you out. No one's going to call down the $100 givers. Nobody's going to lift up five different offerings. Nobody's going to be selling you this. Nobody's going to be swiping your credit card here. Nobody's going to be telling you how much you need to give. You need to feel like you are safe when you come to the house of God, that you will not be abused financially. You will not be molested financially. You will not be taken advantage of financially. That in this place, you are financially safe. That all you are asked to do is pray and obey what the Holy Spirit moves on your heart to do. And when we raise our offering, it ought to be the quickest thing we do in worship because it doesn't take long for you to obey what God has told you to do. You ought to feel safe in the house of God. And it's a shameful thing to be in God's house and not feel financially safe. That's what Jesus is talking about. The Sermon on the Mountain, chapter 7. He's preparing his followers to live as disciples when he's gone, and this is what he tells them. There, and he says, watch out for false prophets. He says, because they will look like sheep, innocent, docile, cute and cuddly, but inside, they are ravenous wolves. As if a wolf ain't bad enough by itself. Jesus says false prophets are ravenous wolves. They want to consume everything you have. They want to take from you. They want everything you have for themselves. He says this, a false prophet is not simply defined by what they teach you. False prophets are identified by how they treat you and what they try to take from you. So Jesus says, beware of prophets and preachers and pastors and bishops and elders and ministers and churches that consume from you and give you nothing back. So watch what he says. This is what I encourage you to do. Judge a tree by the fruit it bears. Look at the fruit to determine if the tree is of God or not, because every tree is not ordained by God. Jesus has real trouble with trees that don't bear fruit. Bible readers will remember that when he's on his way to Jerusalem to face the Sanhedrin council, when they're coming up to Jerusalem, Jesus passes by a fig tree that doesn't have any figs. And he curses the fig tree. The fig tree dies, and the disciples are tripping out. They can't figure out what is wrong with Jesus that he would cuss a fig tree. Why does Jesus curse a fig tree? Especially when, in the season he went, it was not fruit-bearing season. You know, it's kind of like, like Jesus finding an apple tree in January and killing it because it doesn't have apples. It ain't supposed to have apples in January. Why would Jesus curse a fig tree when the fig tree wasn't even in fig-bearing season? Well, here's the answer. That's why you send your pastor to school so they learn some stuff. 
Fig trees are different than most fruit-bearing trees. They bear fruit before they blossom, so that when the blossom is present, the fruit should have preceded it. The reason Jesus cursed the fig trees, the Bible declares that while he's on his way to Jerusalem, he sees the fig tree and sees that there is a blossom. So the blossom makes him believe there should be fruit. And when he shows up at the fig tree, it's got the blossom, but it ain't got no fruit. And Jesus curses it because he's saying to it, you fooled me. You led me here by the blossom, but ain't no fruit. You tricked me. You had the signs of fruit, but you ain't have no fruit. You hoodwinked me. You had the cross on the building, the members in the pew, the cars in the parking lot, the offering being raised, the shout on Sunday, but y'all ain't got no fruit. And woe to that church that's got the glitz and the glamour, but ain't bearing no fruit. Woe to that church with pastors indicted on tax fraud and money laundering schemes and ripping millions of dollars off of members. Woe to that church that raises millions of dollars and you only see it in the pastor's driveway. Jesus says, judge a tree by its fruit. Don't, don't be hoodwinked by how tall it is how many members it has, how much they shout on Sunday, look at its fruit. So today I want to do what I've never seen a pastor do. I do it with some trepidation, but I want us, rather than to preach a sermon, let's examine some fruit. I want to show you where the money goes after you put it in the offering plate. The reason I want to do this, Dustin, because most times when we give to church, it's, it almost seems like we're giving to a black hole. You give, and then you never know what happens to it. I don't know about you, but that's the only place in life where we give and don't expect some accountability. Whenever I invest in a mutual fund, they send me a prospectus. Now, I don't read it, but, I, you know... <laughs> A prospectus is them trying to share with you how the fund has performed so that you can have confidence that when you sow your money, you're investing in something that's going to give you a return. That when you give, there ought to be some expectation of accountability. Now, that's new for us because many of us have heard it like this. You've heard people tell you this, well, you know, uh, when you give your money to church, uh, you're not giving it to church, you're giving it to God. So you shouldn't be worried about what the church is doing. You all just leave that alone. God, God will handle them, but you give your money to God and you do what God is right, as if we should not be accountable for what you do, what we do with what you've given that you've earned. There ought to be some transparency. There ought to be some truthfulness. Transparency and truthfulness honor God. And when a church does not operate in transparency and truthfulness, there ought to be some suspicion. Where's the fruit? Well, before I open up the books and show you the fruit, I want to tell you something, that every year the Board of Trustees of Alpha Tree Baptist Church engages an independent financial accounting firm to conduct a full audit, audit of the financial procedures, records, and monies of Alpha Street Baptist Church. Every year, we pay a firm to come in to review our revenues, our expenditures, to review our book counting, bookkeeping, to review our financial policies, our procedures, our controls, our receipts, to be certain that everything is in order. And for the last 10 years, although I assume it was longer than that, I can only speak for the 10 years that I've been part of this family. For the last 10 years, that audit has given Alfred Street Baptist Church what is called an unqualified opinion. Now, I don't know a thing about finances. When I saw that, I got depressed. <laughs> Un we, we don't qualify? Oh. Uh, unqualified, it kind of sounds like having bad credit. Sorry, you, ju you just didn't make it. Um, 
So I have to learn what unqualified opinion means. And those who are financially minded, you already know this. Unqualified opinion means that we have a gap, G-A-A-P, that we are operating according to what is generally accepted accounting principles, which simply means no money has been misplaced, no money has been stolen, everything is where it's supposed to be, our policies are according to the law, we handle the money correctly. Nobody's taking anything that they shouldn't take. Everything is where it should be. So for the last 10 years consecutively, we have gathered an audit that says everything is transparent. Everything is being done correctly. There's not a dime missing. There's not a dollar stolen. Nothing is not going where it should not be going. Everything is where it should be. And that is not usual, y'all. You know corporations that don't get unqualified opinions. You know nonprofits that don't get unqualified. You know sororities and fraternities where money goes missing. And for 10 years consecutively with the growth of this church, with the income that we generate, there has not been any missing money. And there are three groups of people we ought to thank. The first of all would be our board of trustees for what they do to set correct governing policy and procedures that all of our money might be handled correctly. I want to thank the trustees for the work they do to be certain that money is handled correctly. Then in the daily operations, I thank Dr. Elaine Kreider and Dr. Cedric Roberts, our church administrator and our CFO, to make certain that the operations align with the governing principles that are established by the trustees. And finally, there's a group of men and women who you have probably never known, who show up every week, and some of them have been doing it for 30 years. They are the ones that we call the trustee auxiliary team. They count the money. They package it correctly. They make certain it is deposited. They spend hours of their life after you're already at brunch, continuing to count the money and put things in the right place. And we would not be who we are without the auxiliary teams of Alpha Street Baptist Church that count the money. Many of them come to 11.30 because they've got to stay afterwards. Some of them are in the back right now. But if there are any present or former auxiliary members who are in the sanctuary, I want you to stand because I want you to see some of the faces that have dedicated hours of their lives to making certain money is handled correctly. Do we have any auxiliary members here in worship? I know we've got two. Yep, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Many of them will be at the next service because they stay afterwards and they come to 1130. It's convenient. So let's show the money. I wanted you to know about the audit so you know what I'm about to share with you are real numbers. Right? The, the, these, this is not alternative fact. <laughs> There's no spin on this. I promise you this is more truthful than what you're going to hear at the State of the Union. <laughs> That's a fact. Don't you trust everything you hear? <laughs> um, where does the money go? Where does the money go? Well, the best way to present it is to show you the major categories of spending. We always talk about giving, but we never talk about how we spend. So there are four major categories. If you put the pie chart up, please. Four major categories of spending. Um, and this, man, I, I got to memorize this because I'm getting old. I can't see this thing. All right. <laughs> um, yellow is ministry, blue is salaries and benefits, orange is mission, and gray is administration. I'm going to walk you through those, but those are the major categories of spending. Mission, salaries and benefits, ministry, and administration. Let's talk what's about salaries and benefits. As you'll see on your chart, 30%. 30 cent out of every dollar you give goes to support the work and the salary and benefit of 49 full-time and 15 part-time workers at Alfred Street Baptist Church. The daily operations of this church require 49 full-time, 15 part-time individuals who receive compensation through salary and benefits the same way you do at your job. We work on a lot of volunteerism but there's a lot that requires staffing as well. They work in, we have various departments in our church, from facilities to culinary, to information technology, to audiovisual. 
membership services, communications, human resources, finance, ministry programming, ministerial staff, and children and youth programs. Those are our major departments where those 49 full-time and 15 part-time people are employed by your giving. 30 cent out of every dollar goes in that direction. Now, I want to let you know a few things about those who work and are compensated through your giving. Number one, everyone cannot work at the church. Although we would love to hire everyone who's unemployed, the reality is, is that everyone cannot work at Alpha Street Baptist Church because you work too hard for your money for us to use it and compensate people who don't work equally as hard. And everyone doesn't have the right work ethic to work for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. We cannot afford to hire lazy people who believe that because they work for a church, they should be allowed to get away with anything, show up anytime, do half a day's work, get a full day salary when you've worked harder than that to earn your money. I want you to know, and I share this, my staff can't say man because they want to keep their jobs, but I'm going to testify. <laughs> Stephanie, I am not the easiest person to work for. I know that surprises you. I'm, you know, I'm loving and I kiss the babies, I pick up the kids, you know, I shake the hands, I hug you after church. Don't let that Sunday fool you. I am not the easiest person to work for. I have high demands for our staff. To work at Alpha Street, you need to know, because these are the people who are compensated by your giving, we have three real requirements that cut out half the people who want to work for us. Number one, you have to have a spirit of excellence. The Bible says that Daniel distinguished himself because he had a spirit of excellence, which means if you are comfortable with mediocrity, you are not fit to work in this environment. We need people who are committed to doing it to the glory of God, to the best of their ability, to giving it all they have because they realize God's name is attached to the work that we do, and I cannot give God anything less than excellence. Number two, they have to go the second mile. Jesus said that if a man asks you to go one mile, go two that we need people who go above and beyond the basic job description. Everybody knows someone on your job who wants to do the bare minimum. Look, they only pay me to do this. I need people to work for us who say, I may be paid to do this, but I'm going above and beyond because my compensation is not just my check. My compensation is knowing that God is pleased with the effort and the work that I bring, so I go above and beyond what is required of me. If you got to leave at 5 and can't stay to 5.15, don't apply here. If you don't want to give more than what is asked of you, this isn't a place for you to work. We need second mile people. We need spirit of excellence people. And number three, we need water walkers. We need people who, like Peter, are not afraid to get out of the boat and walk on water. People who say, I can't just do what has already been done. I'm trying to do new things and trust God. Listen, I don't want Alpha Street bringing up the rear. I don't want Alpha Street being like any other church down the street. I want to be out in the front. I want us to lead the way. I want others to look at us and want to model what we do in church for the kingdom of God. We've got to walk walk on water. Everybody can't work for us. And we've had to make some transitions here and there. But I want you to know 30% of what you give goes to salary and benefits. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Because the industry norm for for-profit organizations hovers around 35 to 40% of income to salary and benefits. Not-for-profits are even higher. Anyone who works at a not-for-profit organization knows that non-profit organizations can spend almost as high as 60 or 65 percent of their income goes towards salary and benefits. Alfred Street is at 30. Why is that important? So that no one can ever tell you all they're doing is taking that money and giving it to the pastor. 49 full-time 15 part-time are fully compensated and accurately paid by 30% of what you give. It's not making anybody rich. Nobody drives a Bentley. Nobody has a private jet. Nobody goes around in a helicopter. All that you give is not going to pad somebody's pocket. Don't ever let someone put that label on Alfred Street Baptist Church. 30% salary and benefits. 
The highest percent goes towards our administration, 38 percent. 38 cent out of every dollar you give goes to what we call keeping the lights on. The administrative cost, to be certain that our building, our campus, is accurately prepared for worship and ministry. Facilities management, cleaning, decorations, maintenance and repair, utilities, information technology, hardware and software, sound, screens, video, overflow, musical equipment and instruments, heating and air conditioning, lights, furnishings, service fees, communications, app, web development, transportation, security, food, parking. Someone at first service said, what parking? Hush. <laughs> We're working on that. We're working on that. Um, think for a minute of how much it takes to keep your house running with internet and heat and lights and water. And although we would like for them to give us all that free, they don't. So multiply your house by a thousand and you're starting to get close to what it takes to keep this building running. Sometimes because it's so, it's carried in such a spirit of excellence, you begin to take for granted all that happens to make this building work. You've never come outside to find trash. It's never not been decorated correctly. You've never come in and the heat didn't work, the air wasn't on, the lights weren't on. You've never smelled the bathroom when you walked in. You came into the sanctuary, there weren't even trash left over from the last service and they just left 10 minutes ago and it's already been cleaned out. We take for granted everything it takes. The Wi-Fi is working, you come in here, your phone automatically connects. Every time you come in and a new member connects, we got to increase the bandwidth so people can get Wi-Fi within the church. You don't even need Wi-Fi while you're in here. I don't even know what you're doing on your phone. Yeah. Every time Baptists get together, folk want to eat. Folk got to get paid. We got to purchase food, got to prepare it. So you go downstairs and have some fried chicken. We are always up and running. There's never a day when this building is not operating. And therefore, think about the cost of keeping Alpha Street running. And 38 cents out of every dollar keeps the lights on. But because you keep the lights on through your giving, in 2017, we were able to do some phenomenal things in the name of Jesus. Because the lights were on, because the air was working, because the bathrooms were functioning, because the grounds were clean, because the furniture was prepared, because the building was repaired, because the Wi-Fi was operating, we were able to do some phenomenal things in the name of God. The Bible says this, that when the tithe came in and the priests collected it, they had to tithe the tithe. They had to take 10% of the 10% and be certain that that went back to the poor in Israel. So we want you to know that in missions, the money we took to send outside the church walls to be certain that we committed ourselves correctly, this past year, Alpha Street Baptist Church in missions gave $1.85 million outside of these church walls to bless people who are in need. One. Point eight five million dollars went outside Alfred Street. I want you to know that that means 12 percent, 12 cent out of every dollar you gave went into the heart and the home of someone who was in need. 1.85 million, 12 percent. The biblical command is to tithe the tithe at 10 which means that in 2017, we went above the biblical commandment of 10% and met 12% and blessed with 1.85. Don't ever let someone tell you they ain't doing nothing in the community. Let me tell you where that 1.85 went. We have a poor saints offering because we believe that it's a shame to worship in this kind of building, raise this kind of money, and have members in our pew who are getting evicted members who have no heat, members who have no food, members who had an unexpected tragedy or unemployment come their way and they're struggling, they ought to be able to come to the church and take, be taken care of. The Bible says we ought to take care of each other. So in Poor Saints, I want you to know this past year in 2017, more than 120 families 
were granted more than $350 thousand dollars to be certain that their lights were on, that their rent was paid, that food was in their refrigerator, that they were taken care of. Our deacons developed a policy that allows us to faithfully use your poor saints offering to help as many people in the best way possible. They looked at other churches, and you're going to be amazed, many other churches will only grant their members, some of them only $50 a year, some the max was like 250 The policy generated by our deacons that are administrated by the deacons that takes care of your poor saints offering blesses our members with more than 10 times what other churches give to take care of their members. Shame on you to claim to have 10,000 members and raise $30 million and only give someone enough money to not even pay their cable bill. We are a church that takes care of our own membership so that no one is hungry. No one is evicted. No one wakes up cold. No one wakes up without electricity. No one wakes up without food in their refrigerator. Thank you for helping take care of our own members. And the deacons decided to tithe poor saints, which means we take 10% of what's given in poor saints and send it to those who aren't even members of this church. So I want you to know last year, $56,000 went into the homes to pay bills for folk that don't even show up at Alpha Street, that have never worshipped, that never come through that door, that live across the street and came to the church and said, can you help me? And the Bible says that when you see the hungry, when you see the needy, when you see those who are homeless and you don't do anything for them, you've done nothing for Jesus. We bless folk who didn't even go to Alpha Street. Let me tell you something, when the word got out <laughs> that Alpha Street helps people who are in need, they come every day and they receive every day. We bless in poor saints. Right now we partner with 55 external organizations to whom we contribute money to make a difference in Alexandria, the nation, and the world. Through those partnerships, we were able to send 160,000 sanitary napkins to Liberia so that young girls in school can still attend class when they're on their menstrual cycle. We found out those young ladies couldn't go to school when they had their menstrual cycle. And we said we got to do something about that. We're still sending over supplies. Our goal was 300,000. We're still in it. You may not know this, but your giving helps us feed 106 families in four different villages in Nigeria every month. Amen. Because of your giving, we are able to touch 525 homeless people every month in our homeless outreach program. Because of your giving, we raised $135,000 for hurricane, flood, and mudslide relief through the tragedies that we experience in different lands and in different cities this entire year. Because of your giving, we were able to bless 1,050 children with Christmas toys for the entire Christmas season. We were able to give 500 families full Thanksgiving dinner baskets. We were able to give 1,200 families full Christmas dinner baskets. And this year, Brothers Keeper was able to put together school supplies and coats and backpacks to bless 12,000 children on their way to school in the spring. 12,000 children were fully equipped for the year because you kept the lights on. Because you kept the lights on, we were able this year to complete our million dollar pledge to the National Museum of African American History and Culture so that we are still the only church in the United States of America and the world that gave a million dollars to make certain that the story of African Americans is never lost in this land because you kept the lights on. You can walk in that museum and look at the million dollar donor list, it's the highest one. And you go down five, and you're gonna see Alpha Street, and you can say, that's our church. That's what we did, because you kept the lights on. Because you kept the lights on, not only were we able to do 12% emissions, but 20%, 20 cent out of every dollar you gave, helped support the ministries of the church. 
the internal work that we do. Because of that, we were able to have some phenomenal events. Our graduate luncheon this year, oversold, capacity, done. Our women's hat luncheon, full capacity, done. Our men's and women's conference, our father-daughter brunch. This year, as we're going out towards the Gaylord for our HBCU, we've got 8,000 students registered to come, the largest number we've ever had before because you kept the lights on. We were able to do our programs uh, that celebrated athletics. We had our Christian walk with over 600 people. We had our Faith 5K, the first one. We've had our softball team. We had our health and wellness fair. We've had so many things happen because you kept the lights on. The church was able to remain active. And the best part is let me share with you how your money changed the lives of young people. Because you kept the lights on and you gave, every Monday, 190 people, young children, show up at Alpha Street Baptist Church and are tutored so that they can prepare to do well in their academic pursuits here at Alpha Street Baptist Church. <laughs> on the next day, on Tuesday, 281 children show up for Awana to memorize the Word of God and put it in their heart. On Sunday, 194 children are in Sunday school learning the Word of God and fellowshipping with each other. In our Girl Scouts, 79 young women are being taught how to be strong black women to stand up and never be molested, never be abused, never be taken advantage of, but know that they are equal, that they are powerful, that they will change the world. 46 young men partner with them in Boy Scouts and in Cub Scouts learn values of integrity and honesty and Christian character. And when we worship at 1130, let me share with you what your money does. It allows all of the babies from 18 months to four years to fill out the nursery. It allows 194 children to go to Kid Street to worship the Lord our God. It allows 99 teenagers to show up at higher ground. It allows more than 50 to go to Crossover, which is our preteen worship. So at 1130, the babies are downstairs worshiping. The kids are across the street. The preteens are at a crossover. The teenagers are at higher ground. And all y'all old folk are in the sanctuary. And we are worshiping God. <laughs> Amazing things are happening. Did you know that if your child in high school is active in two ministries, for two years leading up to their graduation, they receive an Alpha Street Baptist Church scholarship. Last year, 20 qualified. We gave them each $5,000. That's $100,000 of your money that helps somebody else go to school because you kept the lights on. There are children in college today because you gave. And when those kids come home, we've not only been sending them care packages, Reverend Sullivan has been sent to visit them, to pray with them, to be certain they're all right. When they come home, they receive a little Christmas love. You know, when you're in college, every little bit helps. We gave 98 college students $300 over the Christmas break. That's almost $30,000 given to be certain that they are doing well in college, not to mention they get laptop computers, not to mention all the scholarships from the foundation. We are changing a generation of children to change the world. Can I give you the best part? The best part is last year because we kept the lights on and because you allowed 30 cents of every dollar you give to help support salary and benefit, because you allowed 38 cents of every dollar to support the infrastructure, because you allowed 12 percent to go outside the doors of the church, and because 20 percent helped in ministry, I want you to know that last year we were able to fulfill one of the greatest commandments we have, which is to make disciples in the name of Jesus. And last year, 117 people experienced the salvation of Jesus Christ as born-again believers because you kept the lights on. Because you kept the lights on and we worshiped and we ministered and we gave and we built 
We were blessed by God for God to send us 732 new members into the Alpha Street Baptist Church because you help keep the lights on. Look at the fruit. And because you gave, let me share with you how good God is in giving back. Can, can, I, can I just share with you a little something that, that, that ought to make somebody stand up? Um, uh, we, we're getting sponsored by Facebook for our HBCU this year. And they say, you know, we like what we see already. They have now gone into negotiation to make a five-year commitment to us. And watch this. The commitment is for a million dollars. Hold on. A million. How much did we just give to the Smithsonian? Hey, and how much is God sending right back to us? Because when you give, you always receive. God takes care of those who handle his business. Bless the name of the Lord our God. For a corporation to give a church a million dollars, you got to be about some business. Show me the money. I want you to know where your money goes so you've been confident in knowing that you can always judge this tree by the fruit it bears. Lord, I thank you for the 215 years of fruit bearing at Alfred Street Baptist Church. When we weren't as large as we are now, when our forefathers and foremothers earned a tenth of what we have, they were faithful and you blessed. Lord, it blows my mind to think about what will happen as we continue to be faithful and graceful in our giving. Thank you that we know the fruit and we can judge this tree by the fruit it bears. For all that you achieved and accomplished through our giving last year, we give your name the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.